Well, um, one of our measures of effectiveness around AUSA is the noise in the room during a during a break, and uh, we've obviously exceeded our our goals for this. And I think all of us would agree, getting back to a little in person opportunity like this is is something that's been sorely missed. So uh, we're going to we're going to continue with our, our program this afternoon. Um, so far, it's been great. This uh, thanks to all of you. This has really exceeded our expectations. Uh, I, I think many of you know we do these one day deep dives throughout the year. Hot topic, AUSA hot topic. Uh, all of you are kind of guinea pigs because we haven't done one for the last 18 to 24 months. So you know we're we're shaking off the cobwebs. Uh, so you're helping us do that. So. Uh, we'll continue uh, this afternoon with our, our next panel uh, entitled Risks from Fort to Port and to the Fight. Uh, we've talked about some of this uh, earlier today in the earlier panels and some of the other speakers, but some of the qu questions here that we'll be exploring are who, who owns the mission critical operations outside the installation? We've talked about that. We'll expand more on that. Uh, cyber will come up again here, I'm sure. And, and even more important than any of that is what training is needed uh, for critical infrastructure and emergency management and response. Uh, to uh, moderate this panel, we've got Mr. Tristan Bannon uh, from Lidos. He's the executive director for renewable energy and climate change at uh, Lidos. And again, uh, Tristan, thanks for you guys' sponsorship for today's event. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I was going to introduce myself, but you did me the honor. So uh, I'm Tristan Bannon. I'm uh, happy to be here with you guys today and uh, happy to represent Lidos uh, sponsoring this uh, this great hot topic. Um, it's been a great conversation so far today, some good questions. So I know this group is not going to disappoint. Um, and I, I know that we have some cards going around for questions. Um, but if anybody wants to stand up and, and you know associate their name and face with uh, with a question, Great way to get some energy going after lunch. Don't anyone fall asleep here. Um, so this is a you know this is a really exciting topic. This panel today uh, from from port to fort and to the fight. And and, and by the way, General Swan, if, if we can get T-shirts printed of that, I love that uh, that that logo. I think Mr. Thomas here uh, invented it, so it's uh, but that's really awesome. Um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna start off by reading a quote. Uh, this is from the 2018 National Defense Strategy. And that is, the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. During conflict, attacks against our critical defense, government, and economic infrastructure must be anticipated. Uh, and really, critical infrastructure now is a part of the warfighting domain. So, so how do we how do we operationalize that? Um, and I think it's a really important concept to think about, particularly in the concept that the Army's recently released climate strategy, which Mr. Farnan spoke on earlier today. Uh, which is going to really drive rapid digitization and electrification of, of uh, installation infrastructure, both on and off the post. Um, you know, the more connected, the more efficient, the more smart that infrastructure becomes, the more vulnerable it is to internal and external threats. Um, you know, how we build in this mission assurance and installations, whether it's utility power, you know, water infrastructure, uh, EV charging. You know, those are the kinds of really hard problems that that I'm lucky enough to get to think about and work with you know every day at Lidos. That's why we're here today, um, and and I'm lucky to have a, a great you know fantastic panel of, of experts from uh, the Army, from academia, from industry, and you know, private sector here. Uh, so I'm going to let them do their opening statements and and talk a little bit about um, you know what they do every day, uh, and, and then I've got a couple of questions I've got teed up, but really want to hear from everyone here in the room, your questions, because you guys are the experts coming from the uh, sectors you're coming from. Uh, and so let's have some fun and, and try to fill up the hour if we can. Uh, so why don't I start off? Um, uh, we've got the Honorable Lucian Niermeyer here. He's founder and principal of the Niermeyer Group. And I'll and, uh, well, just real fast. And then next to him is uh, Mr. Christopher Thomas, Director of Information and Technology from the Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff, G9 U.S. Army. And rounding it out, Mr. Phil Sussman, president of the Norwich University Applied Research Institute. Uh, so, so uh, Mr. Niemeyer, please, you can start with us. Yeah, sure thing. So first of all, uh, General Swan and General Brown, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about a subject doesn't get really paid attention to in the totality of the Army, and that is the resilience and mission assurance of installations. So appreciate the opportunity to, to be able to talk to everybody about this. Um, so I'm coming in from a, a pretty broad background, uh, uh, formerly Assistant Secretary of Defense, 
over the last three and a half years for energy installation environment, where I focus in on a lot of resilience risks, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I'm also a Senate, former Senate staffer, and uh, I seem to be the only Air Force rep. Um, there's been some Navy here. And I do realize that the founding fathers of this country put in the Constitution to raise armies and maintain Navy. They said nothing about the Air Force, so I'm not going to be able to proclaim they were any, any way better than the other two services. So, um, But I do uh, uh, also, uh, I know a lot of folks in the crowd from my Senate days, and I'm very proud to um, recognize the fact that uh, Secretary Pena did call for a tough SOB and needs to get after the issues. For those of you who've worked with me in the past, you know I was that guy. Uh, so anyway, so hopefully uh, you have a chance now to throw some uh, questions back at me. Okay, so when I testified uh, at, at, while I was in the Pentagon uh, in 2019 about resilience, about installation resilience, um, I think the committee wanted me to talk about climate resilience. I ended up talking about technology and information resilience. Um, and I, I believe that's much more of a compelling threat to us than anything right now to be able to conduct our missions. And that is having the wireless and wired comm, having the ability to be able to protect ourselves from, from a cyber attack not just to our IT, not to our networks, but also to the smart technologies that we rely on for mission assurance. Um, they go way beyond just building controls, uh, but the way we interface with our mission owners and, 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 uh, and, and, other, uh, uh, and other owners of, uh, of key mission enablers. In October 2001, the Army released a digital modernization strategy that talks about the need for data to be relevant, to be at speed, to be zero latency in order to provide for future mission success. That is an imperative among the engineering staff as well. Had I been back in the buildings, I was trying to jump that gap between IT and OT. I ran working groups trying to get after OT risk, operational technology risk as it relates to, and it differs from IT risk. You're all familiar with CMMC. We're struggling, we're still struggling. Three years after initiation, we still can't get a framework out. OT risk is even more compelling. It can, it can affect human safety. It can directly impact the mission. In 2018, I had a national article uh, where the headline was quoted by me that an HVAC system can take down missile defense. Everybody kind of laugh, but it's true. All right. We, we, we as a community in the engineering world have to understand how we relate to mission risk and what can be done to improve the resiliency of the systems we're responsible for. It's not the IT team's concern to worry about whether a control has a remote access, wireless remote access that can create a vulnerability for us. That's our engineering community's responsibility. Since then, I've been kind of on, 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 on uh, really focused on this. I run a nonprofit right now called Building Cybersecurity. I get to I'll get to in here many, which is in was created as a private sector facing private sector organization to offer a market incentive for enhanced cyber protections that go on, that go beyond NIST, go beyond uh, current UFCs. What can we do as a nation to really get to the level of cybersecurity we need against an evolving threat? When we talk installations of the future, which unfortunately hasn't been brought up too much today, we are talking installations that are more tech enabled, that across every device from how we run our buildings to how we address physical security, how we fight back drones, how do, how do, uh, we're gonna be relying on technology at a level we don't even, can't even imagine right now. All of those two technologies have to be protected. They have to be enabled. They have, there has to be a mission assurance associated with that. When we talk about um, uh, you know, the threats we face, uh, I'll be clear right now. Unlike, I mean, I'm, I'm nothing against barracks and CDCs and you know, electric vehicles and climate change, but the enemy is in our wire today. They're in our wire. We, we, we just, the federal government put out a Zero, what they call a zero trust architecture strategy. Zero trust means you can't trust anything. The Iranians, the North Koreans, the Chinese, the Russians, they're, they're in our systems now. Now we can kick them out, we can ultimately replace, we can modernize, but they are in right now and they're not waiting. We've already seen cyber attacks. Cyber attacks are going, have been going on now for years. We have a good defense. They haven't necessarily penetrated that defense, but solar winds was a significant cyber attack by the Russians. We do have that risk. And the only reason why it hasn't been catastrophic is we do have some layers of effective defense to be able to fight against that. But when we talk about what needs to be done, it's real and it's immediate. That's why one of the things my organization is doing is we are partnering with federal facility engineers. Right now, federal engineers rely on what they call unified facility criteria. 
that unified facility criteria is based on our, our risk management framework plus application of a NIST framework. Uh, I'm sorry, and I've spent most of my life in federal government, federal regulations and guidance is not moving fast enough. It is not. The cyber threat is evolving by the month. What the Army needs and what we're trying to provide is a private sector uh, uh, expertise brought in through a nonprofit that can supplement and add to what the UFC calls for in order truly to get after not a static system of cybersecurity, but dynamic and ever-changing. What was what was a cyber level a year ago is not what a cyber protection level is going to be next year because the threat's evolving and technologies are expanding. So, so, so we can't rely on this standards to take every three to five years to update. We need, and the Army needs, a, a supplemental guidance that is driven by best practices in the private sector that are evolving every day, that are evolving by the week, that ultimately are seeing what's out there and can offer a, 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 a more comprehensive response. We've also, and I've been, I worked hard on this when I was in the Department of Defense, to try to bridge that IT, OT gap. You've got to know the difference between information technology and operational technology. You also got to know that everything's smart these days. That's, that smart means they are blending together. Like John said this morning, there are no more air gaps. Air gaps is that you know that 2010 call they went through cybersecurity back. All right, there are no, there is no such thing as air. Sorry, is that a good one? <laughs> think about think about the fact. I mean, think about this right now as we're, we're we look at cyber risk. If you buy a vehicle, if you can get one these days because of what lack of a chip shortage. All right, there are 1,500 microchips in your car right now. 1,500. Has anybody asked a question, can any one of them be manipulated to create an unsafe condition in the car? The answer is yes. That's Elon Musk's biggest nightmare right now is somebody's going to hack into the Tesla fleet and make the entire fleet unsafe. We have not engineered cyber protections into any kind of smart device we're doing right now. The nonprofit I'm working on has created that standard, and the expertise we've developed is what we're providing to federal engineers. So I think we have to get after this. We have to be a lot more aggressive, like Secretary Panetta said. We ultimately have to understand that relying on a UFC that was written five, six years ago is not going to solve, it's not going to give us any level of protection. We need to have a more aggressive stance, combining the expertise of the public and private sector. I'll leave it there. No, thank you. That's uh, great comments. And now that I think about it, I'm going to leave my Tesla parked here and maybe walk on today. <laughs> I also really like your, your comment about, you know, mission assurance maturity model for infrastructure. I think it's a really important idea. And hopefully someone will ask a great question about it. Uh, let's go over to Mr. Thomas here. Um, sir, you've got some opening remarks. I think we've got a couple of slides to put up as well. Uh, yes. Hey, hey, good morning, everyone. So, so I have the, uh, well, afternoon, actually, uh, came here in the morning. I actually have the fun job. I get to lay out the, uh, the strategy, and then I get to, to help implement that strategy. Uh, let me pull up my slide. Next one. Uh, not my face, sir. So... So back in 2017, I'm just going to give you a quick story. Back in 2017, IG under, under General Smith here, they went out and, and they put out a report on the Army critical infrastructure. And it, it was pretty, it was a pretty interesting uh, report. Um, I came aboard in 2019 uh, to help look at this problem. And, um, you know, looking at that report, the DAS put out this memo that says, we got to take care of this problem, put together a program management structure for it, sent it over to the Corps of Engineers. But at the time, um, we were putting together this little group. It was all new SESs, uh, uh, about six of us, maybe seven, new to the Army. I have a Navy background, so I, I wanted to throw that out there. We have to bring the, bring the Navy in to fix the Army problems. But uh, uh, don't, don't, don't beat me up on that one, guys. And, uh, I, I just thought I'd throw that out there. But anyway, um, but anyway so these new SESs, you know, no, none of us had a background with the Army. Right? And uh, I wanted it that way so that we can get new ideas. And one of the things that came into our group was this, this program management structure. We have seven of us and our, our aide, one aide. And so it was the big seven we called ourselves. Uh, when we went on the high side and we could talk to each other however we wanted to talk to each other. You know, we were, we were senior executives, so we wanted to do that. But anyway, this big seven actually took this problem set on. And now it's about the big 70 right now. But that just shows you how this has grown with the stakeholders. And we put together this structure that I'm going to talk about. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the fort to fort to fight, because that's a G9's uh, uh, effort there. 
But this control system governance office, I just want to show you guys that the Army is extremely serious about this problem. Once we had a, we had a, a group, we looked at it for a year and said, how do we build this out where we're going to go and look at this problem and identify the things that we need to do? Resources. Do we have the resources? What resources are out there? If you look at branch number one over there, we identified a resource branch. I can tell you today, the Army is the only, the only service that has put together resources to look at this problem, dedicated resources. Uh, we've did that within the last six months. Acquisitions, how do we, how do we look at our contracts and how do we order uh, uh, and, and ensure the security of our control systems? Cybersecurity. Are we following cyber policy? What are the rules out there? You know, looking at the functionals down at the part at the bottom, facility related, civil works, and the others. Everybody was doing their own thing of thing, uh, doing their own thing. No coordination whatsoever in terms of cybersecurity and some of these other areas. How do we herd the cats in and get everybody under the same structure, right? And then tackle this problem, identify those vulnerabilities, get them mitigated, and get them in some type of sustainment so we can. Uh, secure our infrastructure here. Operational technology, you know, looking at the tools out there that will help us secure our control system, especially those high valued assets that we have identified. We have identified about 300, 400 high valued assets that we're going to go after here real shortly here. And then enterprise architecture. How do we figure out what we have out there? So we put these groups, this, this, uh, this uh, group in place, the governance office, to tackle these problems here, training, some of the same things that we talked about throughout the day, the Army is going after. In the process of that, we can't, we, another facer in there, I don't know who sent these slides, but the facer shouldn't have been in there. But anyway, you know, as we started building this out, then we started figuring that, hey, you know what, we have a bigger problem here because the contested environment is way more than our installations now. Our contested environment is our municipals. And our energy partners and our and and the other partner the rail partners you know how does the army as we started looking at this 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 effort here how do we get our forces which we do we're the greatest fighting force on the, on the earth how do we ensure our forces can get off the fort get them down to the port and get them to the fight and you know we've never looked at these control systems here you know we want to send tanks to uh the port of savannah and we're gonna put them on some rail cars and a hacker gets in and instead of it going to Savannah, it's headed off to Norfolk. Well, how do we ensure that our tanks are gonna get down there? You know, again, guys, army got, I'm, I'm a Navy guy. So if I, you know, sand tanks is a, is a far, a far stretch for me here, but, uh, but you know, you guys, you guys know what I, I'm gonna keep it simple in terms of, in terms of weapons for the army, because I really don't know a lot of, but the big picture is how do we ensure right that our forces get to where they need to be right in terms of those control systems like i said we've identified about you know 400 or so high valued assets that we're getting ready to tackle but they're probably about in in the army maybe 600,000 of these things out there how do we look at that picture and get the right ones in a priority order get them get them assessed mitigate it and um and then get them into some type of sustainment so that's what I'm doing. I, I get the good part here because I get to lay out the strategy and I get the hands on in the in the uh, the implementation of that strategy. Uh, I'll pause there. All right. Thanks a lot. Well, let's think about owning the execution of a strategy. There's no escaping the outcomes, right? Uh, all right, Mr. Sussman, if you please give us your opening remarks as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you uh, for having me here. You know, this is uh, in some ways uh, I consider coming home. Um, we're uh, we're in the Gordon R. Sullivan uh, conference room, uh, former uh, 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 chairman of our board of trustees at Norwich University, class of, I won't tell you. Uh, and, uh, and actually, General Sullivan, at the end of his career at, at AUSA, uh, came to school and talked to us about uh, resilient and, and the coming climate change issues and, and really trying to build resilience. And, and we created, out of that set of talks, uh, something called the uh, Center for Global Resilience and Security, which we call uh, CGRS. So you can think about that for a second if you want to look at the board. So uh, as kind of a tip of the hat to uh, to uh, General uh, to General Sullivan, and 
Uh, what he did at the end of his career is he connected Norwich University to the United States Army Engineering Research and Development Center. And in particular, we have Mr. Tom Bazzotta in the back from the Construction Research Laboratory. And we started talking about energy resilience. When I came into the room, I said, if it's energy resilience or it's any type of resilience, then we have to talk about cybersecurity because that's uh, such a critical piece. I'd be overlooking Dan Roper. We wrote an article. Uh, we, I mean, Dan wrote an article, uh, a uh, occasional piece from the Army of, you know, Association of the United States Army about that time, about installations, which in many ways set the, the path forward for us at this moment. So I'm so glad to be here to talk about these really important issues uh, related. And, and uh, uh, Fred, thanks for uh, joining our team and, and playing. So just go forward. You know, the, the interesting part is I started playing this game uh, quite some time ago. When you talk about Black Start, uh, uh, I was actually involved in a, uh, an activity uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s with something called the 39th Information Operations Squadron, who was defining and looking at the electrical infrastructure around Herbert Field in the greater area and Black Start and how do you actually take down the uh, the uh, energy infrastructure and what were the concerns and and back then if you could if you could manipulate the temperature data um, you could either overload or underload the uh, the system and you'd be and if you could somehow debilitate the the black start uh, generation then you could shut down the southeast for a significant period of time so that what was that ninety I think two thousand and two so here we are all these years later. And I've been working uh, cyber exercises on a number of pieces. And I thought I'd start off by saying, trying to tell you some of the things I don't need to convince you today that I've said a number of times in different places all over the United States uh, for, for quite some time. And that is, we don't have to talk about it being a contested homeland. We had to talk about, uh, and I got lectured a number of times, that, uh, that uh, the Department of Defense will protect the homeland and you can't talk to about a foreign nation state based attack on uh, US soil. We, we don't have to talk about that. We know it's here. That, that, that compact is broken. It's the environment that we live in today. The other piece that we don't have to talk about is you, you talked about 2001, can I have my cybersecurity back? Uh, you know, operations technology is vulnerable. We were going to air gap everything. There would be diodes, so you couldn't move information. We're beyond that. We know that operational technology as well as information technology is vulnerable. We know that the systems inside and outside the fence are part of a system dependent on each other, connected, and must be considered part of a whole resilient system. That was not a conversation we would have even five or six years ago. So you have to think holistically. We've made great progress in the way we're looking at these problems and partnering. This is not an IT problem. An awful lot of times they said, go talk to the six, go talk to JTF, GNO, that kind of dates it a little bit. And they're, they're going to take care of the cyber set of problems that we have uh, at this moment. It's not an IT problem. It's a command problem. We fire CEOs who don't put in place the necessary controls and systems to protect their networks and the operations. IT is the lifeblood of the organization. You have to as a commander. So you talked a different way to say that is that it has to in include both the garrison commander and, and the operational commanders all were invested in this topic. And we know that we need to uh, prepare, plan, practice for these types of events to take place in advance of them taking place. It, it, it is essential that we do that. So, so those are things, that's good news. Those are the things that, uh, that we all agree on and we don't have to argue about. But what we don't necessarily agree on at this moment in time and cited in, in, uh, in events, uh, we do, Nuari, Norwich University Applied Research Institute does about, uh, did about 30 exercises from nation state based uh, payments, uh, one and a half, two trillion dollars a day, payments exercise with large banks down to, uh, down to community environments. So we have a lot of experience working. Um, cyber is a team sport. That's something we have to figure out at this point in time. And we need to be able to understand still today who is in charge. We can hear uh, horror stories of, of uh, the FBI showing up saying this is a crime scene. And that used to be a long time ago problem. No, that was, that was about nine months ago that they showed up and said, this is a, this is a crime scene and we're not gonna let you remediate at this moment in time in a healthcare system that, uh, 
uh, that couldn't do any elective surgery uh, for a period of about 120 days um, across nine hospitals in the Northeast. Uh, the other piece is we, we, uh, we have to figure out the titles and authorities and the, and the relationships and the frameworks and the documents have to be in place ahead of time. It's not poof, you're on the keyboard and now you're fixing the problem. There's a lot of steps in between that you have to figure out. And sometimes we just gloss over those sort of pieces, those frameworks, those agreements need to take place. The JAG just wants to say no. And so we need to be able to come over, overcome those sets of issues. Maybe you have a different uh, relationship with the JAG, sir. But um, the other thing is, is that uh, we need to know how to give and receive support in these environments. And because this infrastructure is owned by the private sector as well as engaged by the public sector, then we have to have ways to build trust because you cannot build trust in a crisis. That's something that, that still exists. So we can't wait for that moment in time. So we have to engage before the uh, relationship. And it can't be the bro network. What I found working in the finance sector is what happens is the way you make more money in the finance sector is you start it, you start at City, you go to JP Morgan, you end up at the out at SIFMA, you come back to the New York Stock Exchange. That's one gentleman's uh, 10 year cycle. And he got a, he traveled up each time through. And so he has a whole set of relationships. And so if there's a problem, he picks up the phone and he calls his bro and he says, so what are you seeing over where you are? We need to institutionalize these relationships. It can't be based on that informal set of, of networks. Those relationships must be, must be part of the way that we do business on an ongoing basis. We need to make sure that we're engaging not just the techies, and we must bring in the process and operations folks. This was a, I'd like to claim uh, credit for this, but uh, a number of years ago in something called Livewire, we had a, an exercise we were doing with the finance sector and a gentleman from the bank in New York said, it's all great, you got the techie guys, but you know what, they can't shut anything down. They can't turn down that system. It generates $2 million an hour. They gotta go talk to the guy who owns that system. The same is true here. So translate in your environment. You have to engage the commanders, the process owners, the people who are responsibility, responsibility for the, contact, uh, the continuity of operations of these environments, it's critical. And the commander has to be engaged. The gentleman I was talking about uh, related to, uh, uh, to JTF, uh, JTF GNO, um, uh, retired Lieutenant General uh, Mark Bowman and I spent a couple days together. And he's doing, he's doing training for three and four stars around cyber to try to explain uh, what cyber is and, and how it impacts and to engage them at this point in time. He's about to, he's an old guy. He's going to top out. I guess he's in his sixth year at this point in time in that in that arrangement. But but it's still a really important task that, need, that needs to be done. The other piece is information sharing. The second word in that is sharing, information sharing. If you're going to work with another organization, it requires you not to do information collecting. And we have the information now and we'll give you back what you need. There has to be a give and take in that environment. I know there are problems related to that, but oftentimes that which is classified as related to actors. Actors aren't necessarily what's important when you're trying to solve a problem. So we need to figure out the ways to be able to get that, collect it, and put it back out so that we can work together one team, one fight. And then the other piece that I, I, I just put on this, this uh, in the last uh, 36 hours, 48 hours, is that the home team, that the, the critical infrastructure, is uh, relying on at this point in time, they're being deployed. They're going away. So the guard teams are not, they're not on home station and they are part of what, uh, uh, what the governor wants to reach out for in a circumstance, they're going other places. And so that, that capability is not there. So maybe we need to figure out how to do a reverse DISCA from the installations as we build capability. So, Norwich, Nuari, um, we got uh, basically, um, I got two strategies, okay? You, you plant a tree today or 40 years ago, right? So the tree we want to plant for 40 years from now is working with, uh, with Tom Bazada at the Engineering Research Development Center is really how do we change uh, energy resilience and cybersecurity education at this point in time moving forward? And how do we integrate that? And we're part of something called the Senior Military Colleges, Department of Defense, um, uh, cyber institutes. Uh, we work with the DOD CIO and, and Cyber Command and, of course, uh, U.S. Army Cyber Command. 
and we're really wrapping around things related to work roles. And sir, we want to make sure that we develop the work roles also for in that OT operational technology area. It's not just aimed at the folks who are going to commission. Yes, we commission 11% of the uh, sessions across all services among our schools every year, but we also have a propensity to serve in our institution, and we want to put a lot of those folks into uh, military and Department of Defense service. And so that may be into the IC or, or uh, just uh, on your installations as a, as a cybersecurity expert. So that's the, that's the today stuff. The other today piece is we're working with Cyber Command on, on uh, what's called TSR, Tailored Strategic Retention. You're losing 80% of your operators after eight years. They're getting trained up. They're walking out the back door. And, and Dave, I'm sorry they're going to work for you at Booz. We're going, we've got a program funded by Cyber Command to try to capture them and put them into critical infrastructure. So they go to work in the critical infrastructure for Dominion or for, uh, or for others to be as we're moving along, as opposed to back in the next seat next to them. And we're going to capture them in the, in the reserves and the guard, hopefully on the way out. So that's a program that we're working on. And then, of course, uh, Nuari has developed a repeatable, scalable, and cost-effective resiliency exercise program that produces actionable results, data, and recommendations for improvement. And we've been doing this for about 15 years at this point in time. I'll, I'll yield back my time, sir. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd have to check, but that might be, I think, the first time the term bro network was used on an AUSA stage. Um, all right. So I'll, I'm going to start off with the question. This is for Mr. Thomas. Uh, you showed a really interesting slide, which included four external threats to the installation contested environment. There, was, oh, there we go. Utility outages, cyber attacks, natural disasters, and information warfare. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about what are some maybe some low hanging fruit actions that might be viable to make a real uh, real impact in preventing elements of those threats. Yeah, so so I'm, I'm going to focus on the on the, the installation itself, and, and you kind of see some some circles there: MSEC, InfoSec, installation network. Don't my voice was uh, <laughs> was would carry far enough without me having the mic on, but. Um, so looking at the, the installation itself, and, and, and you can focus on the whole new contested environment, everything is linked up, you got a kind of a chain going around. Um, so when we laid this out, what we were looking for is we wanted to see how, um, what kind of information was really leaking out there? You know, how secure are our networks? Right? So we're talking low hanging fruit here. Are our networks secure? Because in most cases, if someone's going to attack us, they're probably going to come in through a, an unsecured network. That's the way I, I say it. Um, and you have InfoSec itself. You know, what is going around the installation outside of the network? And then MSEC, what is on outside of the network? So three areas we were looking at. And if we can control this information, I think we could probably we could uh, potentially help reduce some of the uh, uh, some of the threats to our installation here. So let me let me just dig in a little more on what I mean here. I, I talked about the network, networks being unsecure. How do we secure our networks? MSEC, the, or the InfoSec piece, what are people saying on the network? And then who's listening outside of the installation, picking up that information that is leaking outside of the network there? So we, if we could look at that first and try to secure those areas, I think we could put, uh, as I said, reduce some of the uh, I'll say noise and vulnerabilities that are associated with our networks there. No, thanks a lot. Now, how about the, um, just pulling the thread a little bit, sure. how about the, the, you know, the friction between standardizing at the, at the, at the central level versus regional solutions? Um, and how, how are you looking at deploying that and, and making that balance? So uh, repeat the question again. Well, I'm, uh, I'm reading one here that's kind of adapted, but have you thought about standardizing solutions, uh, you know, regionally at the installations themselves, letting them kind of own some autonomy for how they how they deploy this versus telling them what to do, having things centralized there at the Pentagon? So, so one of the things we're doing, we actually have thought of looking at this problem. And, and, and I think the problem set is that um, because everyone is doing things so differently out there, especially across our installations and even with the functionals I talked about earlier. So one of the things we're doing here, we're looking at stamp writing policy. That's the good thing about the job I'm in. We also get to uh, influence policy, you know, and, and that's the governance piece also of, uh, of, of building this out here. So we're in the process of building out what we call a standardization policy. How do we standardize across the board 
And we're going to start this out with our FRCS, as our facility related control systems. How do we standardize policy across the Army there on how we do business just with that piece of, of, uh, of, of our control systems there, which is about 90%? Of, of the control systems in the Army. We own that piece there, or, or well, IE&E owns it, uh, which G9 uh, gets to support. Uh, so that's the first thing we're doing. We're trying to standardize policy there. So everybody is on the same level uh, sheet of music there. No, thanks a lot. All right, so here's one for Mr. Niermeyer. Um, you know, we've talked today uh, about public-private partnerships and responsibility for capitalization and for technology development in the private sector and how the army and the department of defense is relying on that how do we build in some of these cyber and mission assurance requirements into privately owned infrastructure where there isn't necessarily the same ability to recoup investment uh, as you're sharing that between defense users and community users Okay, so I think I'll, I'll concentrate on water and energy. All right, so right, but utility companies are already uh, trying to struggle under the existing government standard SIP, um, and a, a lot of utilities are moving beyond that uh, because they realize government standards not being updated fast enough. So I would say that they're as much concerned about cybersecurity as anybody else. So they don't want the lights to go out. So I I, I believe and 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 I've experienced in my nego uh, discussions with utilities that there's really not much that we can invest in that they're already not investing in. But let's talk to water right now. Water is a huge vulnerability for our country. 155,000 um, private water systems around the country and wastewater systems, of which we rely on water for our communities. Completely uh, underinvested or not investing all in cybersecurity. Um, the good news is we've just got an infrastructure bill that's put aside about a billion dollars for cybersecurity around the country. That's just a first wedge. So working, having uh, military installations work their, with their communities, particularly where they have vulnerable water systems that for which the military missions rely on. Work on those uh, on those grant processes that they can get up to, uh, to the federal government and see if they can get some media protection, or using um, some of the defense infrastructure funds that we get that sometimes I think are going maybe not to the top priorities, um, but there is a program within the Department of Defense that allows us to invest in off-base infrastructure, um, and maybe uh, asking where can we robust up cyber protections or other resiliency issues for what we consider to be the most vulnerable uh, 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 utility or water system. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, and I've got one for Mr. Sussman here um, before I go to the audience question. So one thing that we've learned from the last couple of decades of cyber as a warfighting domain is just how quickly technology and tactics can change and how difficult it is to keep up, uh, stay ahead of our adversaries. So, so from a training and exercise perspective, which I, I think you've got a tremendous depth in, you know, what are some ways that we can stay ready in defending installation infrastructure from cyber attacks? Thank you. Uh, you. You know, it's uh, the beauty of, of uh, the exercise process or the, the engagement process is that, that it's it can be repetitive in nature and then updated based upon the current threats and, and attack surface, especially the, the inventory of the, uh, the materials that we have and, and how we're deployed and then modeling uh, what the systems are and how they work and, and what the attack surface is in particular. And then uh, doing an assessment and planning based upon uh, live events and live attacks and current uh, current thrust. Uh, uh, policy is global, sir. Uh, unfortunately, implementation is local, and, and we need to be able to engage the local level to make sure that that implementation matches your policy goals. Oh. Uh, that's great. All right, here's one from the audience. Uh, this is for Mr. Thomas. How is your office resourcing the convergence of operational and information technology to create a secure information backbone? So, um, and I just, this, this, my thing is this new technology is really, <laughs> you know, is really beginning to bother me here. You know, in, in a in a Navy guy, we don't have these things on the shelves. <laughs> so, Microchips in there. So, Compromise. So, so one of the good things that we we've done here is, um, uh, like I said, we we had a first service to actually put together uh, an MDEP that's been designed to look at our critical infrastructure. So the resources to look at this problem, you know, mainly in terms of uh, conducting assessments, um, mitigation of the, of the vulnerability that we discover, as well as sustainment uh, is, is resting in our group there. We did this in about, you know, six months. The office itself has only been stood up for a little over six months. 
uh, and we've accomplished this major, uh, this is a major accomplishment, uh, you know, for any other service, which puts, puts us ahead of the game here. So, so we've identified the resources um, uh, and, and, and we're also working with our G6, you know, who actually owns the network, the CIO office owns the network for those, uh, you know, for those systems that, uh, the ones that it, if we discover that they are on the network. Uh, so in terms of resource, I think we're gonna be pretty secure uh, for the coming years with, with the build, with the stand up of the MDEP over. No, thanks a lot. All right, uh, Mr. Niermeyer, here's one for you. So talking a little bit about, you know, we the impact of 5G, Internet of Things, digitization, is it, do we need to look at the future where we need to limit the adoption of those things in order to create a secure enterprise? Or can we get the maximum, I guess, advantage of technology while still being assured? That's a great question. I'm not sure who's sending it in. It must be John Klein, wherever the hell he is. But anyway, uh, so uh, so no, I don't think we can. Uh, I I think when you we really saw what a, a cyber attack could do to certain critical systems, or in other words, the, the nuclear industry, uh, there was, a, and I think there continued to be a desire to, for some certain critical controls to go to back to analog, um, to move re remove the digitization because it creates such a risk. Um, but for the most part, and this goes to really any of us in society, we're going to have to embrace a smart world. Uh, it's, it, the, the opportunities and benefits are so great for us as far as making things more efficient, more effective, better quality of life. Uh, and more importantly, it's the future. Uh, 5G and, and, and digitization, you know, whoever wins the, 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 uh, the race for 5G in the world is going to control the future economy. I um, mean, the data is the next oil. So th for those, uh, and, and therefore, whoever is leading the charge on secure 5G networks and sec secure systems is ultimately going to have the better security and the better opportunity to prosper and grow. So the goal here is not necessarily any way to write limiting language. The goal is to write what can you accompany a language in. So you're engineering cyber protections, both on the IT and the OT side in the very beginning. It starts with the requirements document. In our world, the engineering world, for those of us who know 1391s, Right now, we don't really have enough written into our 1390. What we're looking for, for not just a cyber static standard, but a cyber performance data standard, and that's the key right now. When we when we design buildings, I mean, right now, uh, those of us who have been in the world know we design the lead silver. Lead silver, once you start the building operation, is useless, absolutely useless. It doesn't drive performance for the building. We need to be able to say this building needs to be cyber silver which gives the engineers and gives the designers what needs to be designed in, but more importantly, it gives the mission owner what needs to be maintained over the life cycle of that asset. So it's a commitment on the front end to have an engineered engineering and, 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 and integration, as well as the operation and sustainment of those controls through the life cycle. That's really what we're missing in the Department of Defense. We don't have anybody at the mission owner level saying, hey, we've got to protect these facility-related control systems. We've got to patch them. We've got to update them. We've got to modernize them. You've got to get to that level. So right now, I don't think we need to, to in any way diminish. We need to embrace, but we need to complement. That's cool. All right, thanks so much. All right, I think I probably have time for one more question. So Mr. Seussman, over to you. Um, can you maybe give an example of a success story that you've had in, in partnering to uh, you know, deploy training and, and enhanced education, uh, contested installations. So if you, I, I would do really well until the last two words. Uh, so if, if you'll, you'll allow me a little leeway, uh, sure the probably our singular greatest uh, success story is, is your finance sector. And uh, we started working with uh, CME in, in uh, Chicago and Citigroup in, in uh, New York City in the late 2000s, 2008, nine time period and uh, supported by the financial services sector coordinating council actually created the first large scale exercise for the stock market. What does this mean for you? Over the next five years, they, the only time they updated their playbook was when they had an exercise and they have a robust playbook and they have expectations of their partners. And we continue to increase the, the folks that participated beyond just the, the uh, the companies within the value chain, but also those critical partners that were taking place. And so now there's an ongoing event that takes place and they practice their playbook and they are prepared as an entity and they know what's going to, what the uh, opportunities are. So that's the, the success story, the big success story. Uh, and today uh, we run exercises with large financial firms in nation state base so that they can create their own playbooks. 
uh, within that environment. And that's, that's, a, that's a huge deal for, uh, for us all and, and being able to go to the ATM and pull money out, or for that matter, for the uh, velocity of the treasuries market to continue to operate on which we all depend. That's great. Thanks so much. So in, in closing, I'm going to give each of our panelists here one sentence to say, what is the one thing that keeps you up most at night? No trick question. Like, so really we'll start at the end and head down this way. So, so it, it, it would still be, uh, my biggest fear is would still be related to the operational technology environment that we exist in and the continued uh, really uh, just movement of IOT within the infrastructure and, and the stuff that is out there that is completely compromisable. About, about two weeks ago, a young man um, at a uh, NCX Norwich grad actually created an exploit on the fly that was embedded in a camera and they rebooted the camera with NSA support five times and couldn't get the exploit out. Uh, so um, I think he's probably, he was, he's uh, got a job offer, but anyways, uh, <laughs> that's, it's, it's, that's the environment. It's not as simple as you think. And, and we are depending upon it every day more and more. That's a huge concern. Got it just <laughs> <laughs> No, my fear is, um, you know, um, that, that our leadership um, doesn't embrace the, the understanding or the criticality that these control systems play and how we are going to conduct future operations for the Army. You know, getting our forces out of that fort, you know, if the, if the base is, is contested, you know, let's say, for example, you know, uh, Peter puts out a, a word to his to his ten thousand members that you know they're doing dog testing on Fort Belvoir, I don't know something along those lines, and people are angry and they want to overrun the base, you know, getting our forces off that base, getting them to the port, right, and getting them deployed, and that you know that means more than just you know flying our forces out. I'm really looking at the logistics part of that. That's what I'm really focusing on: getting those logistics down to that port and getting those those cranes and other things working to get our, you know, our equipment on those ships and get them deployed uh, and get them over to the fight. You know, the enemy wants to delay us. They want to beat us, but they can't beat us. So their job is going to be to delay as much as possible. These control systems, uh, if we don't, we don't tackle this problem and understanding the role that they play in all of that, uh, we're, we're going to be in the Washington Post one day and not in a good sense. Over. One Rhetorical question. I'm going to try. Uh, first of all, I haven't slept in four years since my uh, last NSA briefing on OT threats. So, and that's serious, all seriousness. I realize how urgent this is. I think my biggest fear is what Secretary Panetta said. We've had the warning signs for years and we're not acting fast enough. We are not aggressive enough. We have our priorities wrong. I mean, we're spending billions of dollars of things that may be a hundred year threat. But we have significant existential threat today that we're not paying attention to. So we're, we, this generation is going to have to respond to future generations. Why did we make the decisions we made when we saw a threat that's that's in front of us, that's very real, very immediate? Why did we do? Why didn't we do more? Well, you stole mine, so I won't say one. All right, I want to say thank you, thank you to the panelists for donating your time here. Thanks to AUSA for hosting us, to the audience for your questions.